Into the wild I'll go and into the wild I am It's been a while, freedom child Since I left my roots back home Into the wild I'll go and into the wild I am It's been a while, freedom child Since I left my roots back home Welcome to the Free Birth Society podcast. This is a radical space for women who are ready to celebrate their autonomous choices in birth, motherhood, and beyond. Together, we'll learn about wild birth through personal narrative, we'll explore the politics of birth, and we'll analyze everything that relates to our lives as women from a feminist perspective. Here's your host, Emily Saldea. It's been a wild freedom Are you ready to become the powerful matriarch and wise woman you are here on this earth to be? Wherever you are on your path, Free Birth Society has a program perfectly curated for you. Learn everything you need to know to be prepared for a powerful birth experience with our flagship course, The Complete Guide to Free Birth. Join our groundbreaking Radical Birth Keeper School, an immersive, authentic midwifery intensive, and reclaim birth work as it's meant to be. Take charge of your family's health and wellness and become the herbal healer of your home with our new course, Wild Mother Medicine Chest. Prepare your mind, body, spirit, for conscious conception through welcoming your spirit baby home and call your next baby in. Awaken your innate womb wisdom and remove any fear or doubt about your upcoming birth with our Sovereign Birth Meditation Series. And finally, gain the simple tools you need to peacefully resolve pregnancy aches and exhaustion, pain with body full of grace, and be able to truly enjoy your pregnancy. Head over to Free Birth Society Courses now to join the global sisterhood and elevate your life. After being backed into a corner, fear-mongered and without options in her first birth, Dominique was bullied into a C-section. When she became pregnant again, she was determined to write a new story. She thought she could make it work with her medical midwives by speaking up, saying no, and taking the reins. But it turned out, as it so often does, that that resulted in her medical midwives abandoning her care at 37 weeks pregnant. Facing the paths ahead of her, Dominique knew it was either a repeat C-section or a free birth. So with the support of her friend on the phone, intentional breath work, and finding her warrior strength within, Dominique free birthed her 11 pound baby boy. She speaks of the transformation and inner strength she cultivated and the real discovery of her voice to speak up towards injustice claiming her autonomy and moving towards a life of peace, even if it is by herself. Welcome, Dominique. Hi. Happy to have you here. I feel like this is a long time coming. Oh yeah, very long. So tell me about who you were in your first pregnancy, because I know you're here to tell two stories today. So go back to, I guess that child would be six or so years now. Yeah, 2016. Okay, yeah. So tell us about who you are at that point in your life. Um, you know, what does your pregnancy look like? And, and tell us about that birth. Um, I was uh, late 20s and first pregnancy. Um, I, I, I worked like I had a job and worked in an office. 
Um, and I had like an idea of what I wanted as my for my birth. Um, I was working with midwives and my pregnancy actually went pretty well. Like everything was good. I was working out. I didn't feel sick, stuff like that. Um, but I had like a full plan, like I'm going to give birth at the birth center. I'm going to have a water birth, no medication. And like, I, that was my plan when, with my first pregnancy. So you have registered midwives in Canada. So they have correct me if I'm off here. So that means that they have a birth center near a hospital, right? That you are meant to go into. And so what happens? Do you, how does, how does it feel to have medicalized midwifery care in your pregnancy? It sounds like your pregnancy was pretty simple. How does it, how does it go? Cause obviously we know that at some point it starts to turn for you. Um, yeah, it, it was going really well. Um, they had a team of midwives. I think I had four of them or three or four of them. Um, there was one that I really liked, I really connected with and, um, like think the visits were really, really good. And I was very hopeful for, for the plan. Yeah. And then, and then things kind of went different when the day happened. <laughs> so you were able to go into spontaneous labor um, yeah, I just, I remember I woke up with a lot of back pain, um, and then tried to go for a walk in like, it was December. So it was like really cold outside. I got all dressed up at like 6am and tried to just walk around the block. And then I realized it was contractions cause I had to stop every few minutes, like, and I couldn't walk. Um, and yeah, I think we called the midwives and the one that I really liked was the one on staff, but she was finishing her shift. Like it was about to change to someone else. Um, and then she just said, yeah, like it, does, it doesn't, like it sounds like you're right at the beginning. So probably like by tonight or by tomorrow morning, you'd be like, you know, ready. Um, but it just kept going. And then I think around 10-ish, um, it was just a lot to the point where I wanted to go to the, um, uh, to the birth center. Um, so yeah, we went and it was a girl that I ha had only met once. So like, I just didn't feel like as connected with her. Um, and then the first thing she did was check my um, cervix. And then as soon as she did that, the, my water burst. So oh, no. yeah. And then she's like, oh, you have meconium. So you're going to have to go to the hospital. Damn. Yeah. So it was like, we were at the birth center and then right away, we already have to go to the hospital. So right, right away, my plan is ruined. Yeah. And you know, so many medical midwives intentionally break waters to see if there's mech. It's really dirty. It's really dangerous. Mm -hmm. It's really a dirty practice. And, you know, they're not comfortable slash in lots of places, they're not allowed by their license to support, you know, meconium stained waters at home. And so they will actually intentionally, but seemingly accidentally break waters. It's so dirty. Yeah. Yeah. It, Cause it happened right away. Mm -hmm. um, and like we, me and my partner were like, we were like, no, we don't want the hospital kind of thing. So we said like, what can we do? Like, can we stay or can we, like, what can we do? And she said like, well, you really need to get the heart rate thing um, at the hospital. But if you choose to stay home, um, like she kind of was just fear, like she's saying it in a fear, fearful way. Yeah. Like if you choose to stay home, I'll do my best to support you. Um, but she, yeah, it was like very fear, fearful. So it didn't feel like a choice. Mm -hmm. um, and we had nothing at home, like no preparation, like no, you know, mats or whatever. So yeah, we headed to the hospital, I think around 11. Mm -hmm. And of course, like I'm stressed already. So things aren't going too well for me. Um, and the meconium just keeps kind of, I had a pad and it just keeps, you know, coming out. And, um, I don't know if it was like maybe around 1130 or 12 that I, I got put into like a bed and like in a tiny, I guess, triage room or whatever. Um, and I was going on all fours to be comfortable. And within like a few minutes, they're starting to tell me, no, you need to turn around. Cause I guess the 
you know the velcro um heart thing they're like we can't really read the heart rate thing so you need to lay down um and th that's at the point where things went really bad for me because that pain was unbearable and i just felt helpless like i was just laying down crying um mm -hmm. and i told them no i like i need to I need to get up like I need to turn around and I need to whatever um, so then they said okay well there's a thing we can put um, an electrode we can put that um, in your daughter's head basically um, and once we do that then you can move around so we can screw metal into her head into her swollen yeah fontanelle her cap it yep yeah, so they, I mean, it, they, it, it's, it's actual torture, right? It's an impossible series of options, fake options, and it's torture. Let's strap a woman to a bed and have her writhe in pain with no options and support and then see what happens, you know, and, and then they're going to get you to agree to anything. Yeah, and, and my partner didn't, like, everyone's talking and he didn't know what to say either because we're just first time parents kind of thing. Um, Wow. So they put the electrode in there, but then they still didn't let me get up. Like, I don't know if it was like the different nurses or different whatever, but still I wasn't able to get up and turn around and move. It's, it's because they lied. Yeah. That's it. They don't let you get up once that's in there. They just lied. They wanted to place it. And so they found a way to, you know, and people have a hard time unless you've really seen it again and again or worked in the system people I think have a really hard time believing that it's that evil, but it, it is. Yeah. It's just an agenda, mm -hmm. like the, the intervention. So like, it wasn't even that long of like me suffering in pain and crying and just all that stuff. And then they came back with the heart rate. And of course, you know, like there's like the dips and stuff and they're mentioning how the meconium is thickening so it must mean that the baby is in distress or something like that mm -hmm. um and then yeah said it like so the doctor left and then i don't know when but like just a bit later she comes back she like comes in really fast she's like okay the baby's not happy we have to do a c-section so it's like okay what choice do i have none so at that time, it was just like, okay, they just put me in the room and um, they gave me. Was there Go a part ahead. of you that, like, did you believe it as it was unfolding? Or was there a part of you that was like, this doesn't feel right. This isn't, this doesn't make sense. This is bullshit. Or were you like, okay, yeah, if my baby's in danger, let's do it. No, uh, my thought wasn't if my baby's in danger, let's do it. My thought was just, I just don't have a choice here because like, who's gonna advocate right now? Cause like, I'm in so much pain, I can't even really talk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like my partner didn't know what to do either. So like, and the, the midwife kind of just listened to the staff. She didn't really do any advocating. She's an agent of that system. Yeah. She wouldn't have. She yeah, has to be, you know, because she has to be a good girl because she has to keep her relationship to that, to that hospital. Yeah. Ugh, okay. So you have a totally unnecessary surgical birth when you thought you were going to have this beautiful water birth in this birth center. Yeah, like I got the spinal. Um, they started cutting me while my partner wasn't even in the room yet. Like they, they cut me so fast because the heart rate went down to 60 mm -hmm. um, because of the spinal. So everything was just rushed and a mess. And yeah. Um, yeah. And like the only thing I'm thankful of is that I was able to breastfeed pretty fast. Like the midwife did help with that after. And she, like the baby got put on my chest and that was good. Mm -hmm. Um, but apart from that, it just, it caused a lot of trauma and um, disconnection and yeah, like postpartum depression. Yeah, it's brutal. It's so brutal and it's so, it's so multi-layered when you're in a culture where this is everyone's story. 
Yeah. You know, it's so, it's such a complicated trauma to walk away with. So then who are you over the next three years, or I guess two plus years as, before you get pregnant again? How does that how does that birth shape you? How do you start to think about that birth? And at what point in your life does free birth come into your consciousness? Um, well, I, I had the thought for a long time, like, um, like this didn't go how I wanted and the midwives didn't do like what I thought they would. Like, I, I guess I was naive or just, I didn't know that midwives weren't like doulas I just had the image or like in my head I just thought like oh I have a midwife so I have someone who's going to advocate and who's going to be totally pro natural birth and stuff so yeah I just saw that okay this is not how it is and that's not cool Um, and I started learning about what a doula is and I was like oh I need a doula if I'm going to have another kid and um, I just knew like I wouldn't want a hospital birth for sure yeah. So that's right. So do you hear about free birth before your second pregnancy? Um, I didn't hear about like the word free birth, but um, funny, funny enough, before I even had kids, sometimes I would just, you know, go down YouTube rabbit holes and just watch a bunch of stuff about um, unassisted births. So I did watch like, you know, a woman having a baby in her bathroom or in her bathtub. Um, And I had a friend, she's in the States, but she posted about her birth story on Instagram. So I had watched that and it was uh, at home, like, I guess, accidental unassisted birth. And I just thought it was so amazing. So like, I didn't know it was called free birth, but I knew about people having unassisted births. Yeah. Same, same, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so then do you start to like, what happens next? Do you get pregnant and then you have to figure out what you're going to do? Or do you figure out what you're going to do and then get pregnant? Like how, how do you wind up becoming a free birthing woman? (laughs) Um, Well, I, I got pregnant like in a purpose purposeful way. Like I, I did like, okay, this month I want to conceive so that I can have the baby by this date kind of thing. Um, and then once I was pregnant, I just knew that I want still midwives, but this time I'm going to speak up and this time I'm going to take control, like what I want. Mm. But that was my approach for the whole pregnancy. Like, oh, like she's saying they want to do this or they want me to have a, um, like one of those, what do you call it? Like the hep lock? Yeah. The hep lock you said? Okay. I yeah, need more? Yeah, the IV. Mm -hmm. Um, So there was just things that they kept telling me like, oh, yeah, like we recommend that you do this and to have this. And I just kept saying like, okay, well, like, I don't want that. And no, like I'm not. So you sign up for licensed registered midwifery again. Yeah. And it's with a birth center again. Yeah. One of the midwives was like, she's the same one that was in my team. And she was like part of the different team. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. And so you're feeling at that point, like, I'm just going to speak up. And therefore, even though it's the same system, I can like use it differently. Yeah. Like if they say, oh, you need to do this or you need to like go right away. I'm just going to be like, no, I just want to stay or no, I just want to try this kind of thing. Or like, okay. no, thanks. I don't want this and that. So how does that go? Um. So I don't remember what month or what week it was, but I had written out my, um, my whole birth plan in a visual way, like with the little icons. So once I share that with the midwife, her attitude changed. She like, she like brought me in a room where I guess the birth happens. And it's like, she was giving me this presentation Like, it wasn't just like a one-on-one conversation. She was just like standing there and presenting all the like risks. And because it's, it's a VBAC. So she's saying all the like uterine ruptures and resuscitation and what would happen if something happened, you have to go to the hospital, the baby has to stay here or vice versa. 
like all these like fear mongering things. So when you spoke up about your desires, she pulled you into a dark room and fear mongered you. Yeah. Like it, it was just the, the birth room, like the, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like okay. instead of being in her, her little office that we usually talk in, it's just, it was just a weird thing. It's like, I feel yeah. like she was giving a class, like a, like she's teaching a class. She's just standing there, mm. like just telling me all these things. And it's like, okay, yeah, like I know the risks. Yeah. I know it's one in 200 that I can have a uterine rupture and okay. Like I get it, but my decision is still like, I don't want this, this, this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's just, I just felt like a vibe difference with them after that. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so at that point I wanted a, um, a birth center birth. Um, and then a few weeks later, when I noticed how they were being, I decided, okay, if I'm at the birth center and something happens, they're going to just transfer me and they're probably going to force that. And also I think their birth center, the, it's like 50% get transferred. Like I just, someone shared that statistics. Mm -hmm. So then I decided, okay, so I want a home birth. Like, so, so that we can just like, we're at home, we're in our environment. That's better. Um, at 30, maybe 36 weeks or something, I told them I want a home birth. Um, and then the girl is like, oh, okay, well, the person who does the home birth um, kits isn't here right now. So we'll like follow up with you next week. Like, we'll let you know if we can do it. Um, so I guess that bought them time to discuss between each other. Mm -hmm. um, and then the week after the other midwife who I liked the first time, she is the one who is saying like, yeah, we're not going to, we're not going to do the home birth. Um, and we're like, we're actually, we actually want you to, or sorry, she said, we're only comfortable um, for you birthing in the hospital. And like, they, they changed it where I can't give birth in the birth center now. Um, I guess because <laughs> they wanted me to, like, they wanted me to go meet with an OB, mm -hmm. like have a consult with an OB. And I felt like, no, like, you're trying to push me for hospital birth. So mm -hmm. Like once I didn't do that and I didn't like comply, that's when they started removing my choices. Mm -hmm. So and and their support. Yeah. Right. They and know they, they basically said never it. mind. What? Like they were kind of harsh about it. One of uh, one of the midwives said, "If you choose to stay home, like we're not gonna come. We can call an uh, ambulance if you need one, but we're not gonna come." Yeah, that sounds about so, right. Yeah. So this um, happens at 37 weeks or so? Yeah, around then. And who are you at that point? Are you freaking out? Are you like, what is that like? Um, I was pretty devastated. Um, like, I just couldn't believe that they were like that, like acting that way. Um, and then I think we had one last meeting with them to try to discuss that and just plead with them. Like, can you just let us like, you know, do what we are asking. Um, and then that meeting was just even more clear to me, like that they just didn't care or they just didn't want to help um, with our plans. Um, and I just was crying during that meeting and it's like they were just blank staring at me. Um, so that's when I decided like we're just, well, actually that's not when I decided, but I was like, okay, now I'm probably just going to later labor as long as I can at home and then go to the hospital and just like do what we want and just like tell the staff like kind of thing and just leave us alone um but that I don't know that didn't really I, I didn't like that idea so that's when I started listening to your podcast hmm. and then once I binged listened to your podcast like from an evening and like all night long um, cause I started having Braxton Hicks all night mm. and I thought I was in labor. Um, I just listened to your podcast all night and that gave me the confidence like, oh, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to stay home. And that's what it, like, I'm just going to do it. Yeah. So 38 weeks. Oh my God. And yeah. your partner was down. Yeah. Yeah. He was down. He's like, yeah. okay, we're going to do it. 
Yeah. Um, so I went to the store, got like shower curtains and got like Gatorade and just different things I needed. <laughs> and I, uh, the puppy pads, you know, uh, the blue. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. And so then how many more weeks are you pregnant before you go into labor? Um, I gave birth like 40 plus three days, 40 weeks. So okay. just so you've got like two morning. weeks from the time that you are like, screw it. I'm free birthing. So what is that two weeks like? Um, it was okay. Actually. I just, I kind of kept it to myself. It was just me and my partner that knew our plan. Um, I didn't tell friends or family and I just, you know, spent time. I just like ate spicy soup. I just bounced on my ball and just waited and yeah, it was okay. How much fear were you navigating around the, you know, nonsense that they put in your head around the, the risks of VBAC? Um, I wasn't actually, like there was none, mm -hmm. like, because um, I just educated myself um, in one of the free birth groups I was part of, they had a post where it was like a bunch of PDFs and it was all the emergencies. Um, so like, I just educated myself on like, okay, hey, what emergencies are possible? Like, um, shoulder dystocia or, you know, all that stuff. So I just, you know, okay, th these are all the bad things that can happen. And what do we do if that happens? Not that like, I think I can just save any risk but we live like two blocks from a hospital so if something goes wrong we call 911 yeah so sure. that was and all that stuff is incredibly rare and even more rare in a physiological undisturbed birth yeah i and and with listening to a lot of the podcasts you guys had um i also realized that like my state of mind and my like my state affects a lot of the stuff so I was like, okay, as long as I'm in tune and I listen and I know like what's going on with my body, I'll know when to like, when, if I need to call 911. Yeah. All right. So tell us your birth story. Um, yeah, I think that the day before I went shop, like grocery shopping for like, I walked for like an hour. Um, and then I think that's when my um, contraction started. And then the next day, they just continued all day, just slowly, like all day, I just had contractions. Um, and then at night, it started being like three minutes apart. And it's like, okay, this is, this is it now. Um, and then um, I was pretty stressed. My daughter was still there, like mm -hmm. she's three. Mm -hmm. And um, my contractions started getting further apart because I'm like, oh my God, like my daughter is here and she wants me and I can't, like, I just can't. Um, so once my mom picked her up, things started getting back, like, you know, three minutes apart. Okay, this is intense. Um, and I called my doula, who was in the States. So she, she like, was doing virtual doula. Okay. Um, she helped a lot because she's like, okay, this is, you're, like, you're in this state and just 30 more minutes and then blah, blah, blah. And, like, she just kept encouraging me. And I just focus on my breath. Like that's all I focused on the whole time. Um, so I went, it was like 9 p.m. And then I know like until 2 a.m. at least, I was just like in the bath, um, like on, on hands and knees with the shower on my back and just breathing. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm happy I didn't run out of hot water. Yeah. <laughs> I was in there for a long time. Um, and my partner was sleeping. So I was just in the bathroom um, just breathing and listening to meditation music. Um, and then I think maybe around six, I probably got out because I like, I think I took four baths or four uh, showers in total. Um, I tried to lay down on my side that that was not cool. So I just kept staying on my uh, hands or knees or standing. And um, I think around seven, my water broke on the bed. Luckily, I had the, you know, yeah. keep helping. Um, and after my water broke, it got pretty intense. So I had to start vocalizing quite a bit. Um, and I just remembered my doula saying, don't like try not to like scream 
like high pitch or hyperventilate when things get intense. Just try to keep things low and like just breathe, do your groaning. Um, so I just did that and that helped a lot. Um, and then I think transition or like the, the point where like I just want to give up, it was around 9.30 a.m. Um, I just was getting really uncomfortable. It, it actually felt like um, like a posterior, like the, the, his face was the other way because my back, my back was like really bad. Um, and uh, yeah, 9.30, I just was crying and like I tried to like sit on the toilet to see if it was comfortable and it wasn't. And um, at that point I was, messaging my doula saying I just want to go to the hospital I just want to have a c-section just so I can get that relief of that spinal mm. like just no more pain yeah yeah so I was just like talking crazy a bit and um she encouraged me like yeah, like she validated my feelings she's like yes this is really hard and this is necessary to meet your prince um if you really feel like you need to go um, you can start getting your stuff ready, but just see how you feel in five minutes um, and, and let me know. And then like, yeah, so it took like 20 minutes, I think, to we started seeing the head. My my partner was like, oh, I think I saw the head. And I knew like, OK, once the head when once we start seeing the head, it's almost time. So yeah. just forget the hospital, forget that crazy talk. Um, so it's like I got a second wind like mm -hmm. okay now this is this is the you know let's do it um, so we went to the bedroom and I was just like on the bed kind of like same thing on my like hands or I guess my hands and then my I was standing and I just yeah I just kept vocalizing through each contraction and each contraction the head kept like coming like you could see the head, you could see the hair and then contraction done, the head, like the head just disappeared. Um, so yeah, my partner was just telling me what he was seeing and we just kept going for like, I think it was like two more hours of that. Um, and it was my body pushing. It wasn't me actively pushing. And I remembered my doula to say like, don't like try not to push, just let it happen. So I focused on that and finally I stood up because I felt that pressure of like, it felt like having to poop. Um, so for gravity, like I held on to his neck and I just, during contraction, I just had to like lift my head, uh, lift my feet up off the ground and just like hang and just let the contraction happen. So yeah, that, eventually the head started popping out like crown um and then another contraction his head was completely out um and i think it took four more contractions for his body to come out um but yeah he came out and he was huge <laughs> yeah it's like oh no kidding it took so long and how much did he weigh 11 pounds 11 pounds <laughs> I love it. You know, because a lot of women will refer to their eight and a half, nine pound, nine and a half pound babies as huge. And it's like, no, 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 no. Eight is eight pounds is the, is the North American average. So eight pounds is very, very average. Nine pounds is very, very normal. I mean, common, I should say, of course, 11 is normal, but I just mean now, once we get into 11 pounds, now that becomes like, holy moly, <laughs> you know, it's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, I, was, I was so thankful I was at home because I was mm -hmm. like, had I been in a hospital, they would have said like, this baby's too big and you need oh, yeah. a C-section. So they would have said you need a C-section for a million different reasons. Yeah, yeah. of course. Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah. And of course he took some time. Yeah. yeah. So like as soon as when he was out, I <clears throat> right away, like, you know, on my chest and I started trying to let him, um, what's the word when they like, oh, root, mm -hmm. like try to get, you know, the milk. Um, and then we wanted to let the placenta finish pulsing. Um, so I think we left the placenta for like an hour. Um, but the placenta was still inside, actually. Mm -hmm. 
um, yeah, so it was just for about an hour. And then, um, yeah, the placenta stayed in for four hours. Um, and I just was, my brain was mush. I was just in bed and I couldn't really do much. Yeah. Um, by that time, my mom, grandma and daughter had come. Oh, wow. And they were just in utter shock because they, they thought we were at the hospital this whole time. <laughs> like they had no clue what we were doing oh my yeah. gosh okay and then my like, was it was it like surprise when they came in and you just have this baby no actually um after the baby came out like he came out and I was holding him like this and then my partner FaceTimed my mom so okay. my mom saw a baby at home being born or born already and she just yelled she's like what and she's like, okay, we're coming right away. I don't think that that's unrelated to the placenta taking so long. I think there is a strong correlation between um, basically interrupting, you know, third stage, oh. like, you know, FaceTiming, involving new people, switching, you know, out of that, that immediate, you know, state. Um, I, I hear about those stories a lot where it almost like scares the placenta away a little bit so how did the placenta wind up coming out what's that part of the story like um like I'm trying to remember like at some point because the the cord was a bit sore so it was just really uncomfortable to keep breastfeeding and stuff and and I kind of needed a break at some point like when my mom was um there already so I got um I was like texting my doula is it okay to like cut the cord even though the placenta is not out um so she just showed me like where to cut like how how many inches and stuff so I got um, my partner to get scissors and the clamp and then an elastic for the second clamp and then they cut the cord and then um basically I was just laying in bed like I was just in bed trying to recover and everyone was in the living room, like with the baby. Like I was just alone in my bed, what? alone in my room. Yeah, everyone was with the baby in the okay. living room. Don't love that. And, and then once in a while when the baby, I guess, wanted to breastfeed, my partner would bring the baby and I would try, but then it was so painful, like with the placenta still there. Yeah. Um, I just would cry, I felt like I was in labor again. Yeah. Um, so I was like, no, no, like, just, just take the baby. Like, I just can't. No. Yeah. So I don't remember much of that. Cause it's like four hours went by, but I just, I don't, I don't think I slept, but I just was just mush brain mush. Um, and then finally what happened is I, I got up to pee. So, so like, finally I got up and then after I peed, it just came out. Okay, good. Yeah. So it probably was already. Like, had I tried to get it out before, it was probably ready, but I hadn't got up. Yeah, exactly. And that's important for women listening, because in this, like, DIY birth space that we're all, you know, in, there is there is a learning curve around the placenta, for sure. I mean, around all of it, of course, always. But, um, you know, the placenta almost always detaches in the first hour, first two hours. And so what women often don't know in in you know, in this, yeah, kind of DIY yeah, space as I'm calling it right now, um, is that the placenta often takes quite a bit of effort. And so even though it's detached, most likely off the uterine lining, off the uterine wall, if you think about what it must look like in there, it's like a big old jellyfish pancake, you know, sitting over a much smaller cervix. And so, yeah, pulling it out, coughing, squatting, um, really giving it a strong pull is very, very, very often what is needed but women don't know that and so I'm and so glad the, the fear too of like if you pull too hard and then it like you know something happens or it rips yeah. or whatever but you, like can, I was scared of you that. can trust yourself you're not gonna you as the birthing mother are not going to hurt yourself yeah yeah like no one else was trying and I just I tugged a tiny bit and I was like nope nope mm -hmm. I'm not doing that it's right. not ready yeah 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 yeah. Well, I'm really glad it was fairly undramatic. I hate that you were abandoned in your room alone, but I'm really glad that didn't cause, you know, some sort of drama in an unnecessary transfer. Yeah. Yeah. So then, um, 
he like then he slept like so well that night mm -hmm. like just so peaceful um and i think it took two days for me to realize i tore mm -hmm. second degree um and i had heard about tears and like you don't really need stitches if it's not too um severe um but yeah there was like a nurse that came to my house um a public health nurse mm. and then she looked and she's like oh you have a tear and i was like what i didn't tear <laughs> like i didn't feel it at all um but yeah i think five days postpartum we went to the doctor just to check on the tear to make sure it wasn't like a third degree um, and then the doctor was like, oh, it's, it's totally fine. Like it can, it's going to heal. Like, I, I actually really like that doctor because she, like she has multiple kids and she was very nice about our experience. She was like, oh, like, congrats. This is like, you're so courageous. This is amazing that you did that. She wasn't like shaming or anything. So, and it was like, just um, like a family doctor. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that was the only, like, medical thing we did. Just go visit and make sure everything's okay. So you and didn't then, get stitches? No. And, oh. yeah, and I think it was too late either either way. It was, like, too late already. Yeah. Um, so, like, the recovery was a bit rough because it was the first vaginal birth. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like I got hit by a bus down there. Like, it just, it was so painful. <laughs> um, but, yeah, after a while. And, and I also belly binded. So that helped kind of keep things in and just support. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was really good. And it, it tr like transformed me, like my, it, it healed that um, first trauma, yeah. that experience. How would you say it transformed you? Um, I, I just think like before that, before the, that birth, I was a bit down. Like I just, you know, um, that trauma from the first birth was still there. And I just, um, I guess I didn't really believe too much in myself yeah. and stuff like that. But after that, I was like, oh my God, like I can do this. Like I'm powerful. And like, I feel like a warrior and um, just the experience itself, like with all the breath work, it's like, it was, I felt like I was in a different, um, I don't know, like it, it, it it's like my mind was in a different universe, you know, like it, it was very deep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how, would, how would you say, so that was three years ago. So how would you say your free birth has changed your whole life? Like what's, what, what, what might you want to share that, that has actually like manifested as transformation? Um, it, I, yeah, I think, I think it changed like a lot about me um because like i just noticed that um when cri like when there's like times of crisis i i do really well like under pressure and you know because it's like nothing is as intense as what i went through with the birth so like this is fine mm -hmm. <laughs> like i i went through some stuff like stuff that's really hard and i just coped well and um i'm like really good with going back to that breath Cause you know, I, I, I think I did 14 hours of breath work with the birth. So anytime there's something hard, I just, I do really well. And that's like huge compared to before. Mm. So it's yeah. perseverance and strength. And... Yeah. And just, um, I advocate for myself in like all situations. Now I, I have my voice before, like I was too shy to speak up about stuff. Mm -hmm. But now it's like, if, if there's, um, injustice of something, like I'm not scared to speak up. Okay. So yeah. Anything else you'd like to share to wrap up, wrap up your story? Um, just, just that, that the experience was so powerful and changed my whole life. Um, and, um, I did end up getting out of the like the union I was in just, it just wasn't the right one for me. And um, I feel like the experience helped me see, see that clearer. Um, so yeah, I'm just, now it's just me and the kids and um, you know, I, I'm doing good. good. Well, thank you for your time and thank you for your, yeah, willingness to tell your story. Thank you. 
that's it for today, my sisters. Check out everything we do, including one-on-one and group coaching. Learn about our private membership, in-person retreats, and more on freebirthsociety.com. Our online courses are on freebirthsocietycourses.com, including our flagship course, The Complete Guide to Free Birth. Don't miss the Radical Birthkeeper School if you're ready to become the authentic midwife that women are searching for. Together we rise and the revolution starts inside each of us. I'll leave you with our Free Birth Society theme song, Wild Woman by Aruba Red. I honor you for the wisdom you held, the ancient traditions of plant medicine and womb magic. I feel the spirit of the ancestors as I place my hands upon my belly. This sacred portal will be honoured. Eons upon light beams of survival withstanding the eradication of our power by design. I will not allow the separation of our young to be forced upon me. My sisters will no longer birth in captivity. The picket line redefined from burning our wild women to paralyzing us and drugging our babes. Strapped down in a clinical white bed, drying up the milk from our breasts, keep your needles. My family will never again be doomed to chase those dragons or your poison. We reject your fear. We choose love. Everything with intention. Death. Ascension, I will fly and bring her back.